COVID fatigue. This is what COVID fatigue looks like. Totally immobilized. Nobody would give me the time of day to listen to me about having prolonged symptoms. It's my 30th birthday and it's sad that my mind state is, I just want to make it to that. I would say take a breath because this is going to be a long ride. And now to new research on the devastating long-term effects some experience with COVID-19. More than a million Americans could have symptoms for weeks or even months after contracting the virus. We recognized fairly early on that there was increasing numbers of patients who just were not getting better were reporting these symptoms. They're living in this kind of no man's land where they're still in a state of crisis loss and dealing with the complicated search for answers. There was nobody that could help me. I had this moment in which I was like, okay, this is how it's gonna be. I really don't wanna live like this. And I started to come across these groups online. And that's actually where I found Noah Greenspan and the pulmonary wellness organization that he runs. They have been a huge blessing in my life. Go, 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 good, good, good. Keep going, keep going. Don't breathe in, don't breathe in. Go. Great. Perfect. That was your best one. It's hard to get people to understand that, A, it's not just the elderly that can get sick or die. Um, it can be anybody. You could be in your 20s, you could be in your 30s, you could be in your 40s, you could be in your 50s, you could be an athlete, and you could still get sick. You know, we were so tied up in the midst of the deaths and dying, uh, that these patients were forgotten. And now we're catching up to them. And literally in the hundreds to thousands. Millions of Americans have recovered from the coronavirus, but many who have recovered are still suffering the after effects. They're known as COVID long haulers. Researchers estimate about 10% or one in every 10 COVID-19 patients become long haulers. I know Noah said this before, you kind of stick your hands in a bowl, you pull out a couple pieces of paper, um, crumble them, and whatever you pulled out are your symptoms from the day. Over the time of the 13 months, I developed 97 of the 100 COVID symptoms. COVID toes, fevers, I mean, uh, COVID lips with these huge swollen lips with these large blisters everywhere. Your head feeling like it's gonna explode, the burning, the uh, neuropathy. A lot of trouble sleeping, waking up every few hours. You know, with the POTS came all sorts of nervous system problems, shakiness, tremors. It's over 200 things that you're feeling and you never know hour to hour what it's gonna be. You know, at no other time in history were people with 102 fever who can't breathe, who are having chest pain, told that they're not sick enough to go to the hospital, told to wait and this will be gone in two weeks. It just was unprecedented. A year of my life has been trying to stay alive and being alone and isolated and such excruciating pain and then having doctors not believe me or Tell me it's anxiety. <sighs> I would get told at urgent care, oh, I had COVID too. Maybe you're just anxious. They would be like, no, it's in your mind. I'm like, uh, no, it isn't. Like something's really wrong. Yeah, but look, all the tests are good. You're fine. You're like the picture of health. I'm like, well, I'm not. Something's wrong and I'm telling you. I have a cardiac effusion and they're telling me you're fine. Now, where is it that a person should have fluid around their heart and be okay? They started saying that I was psychosomatic at one point. As soon as I would come in, they're like, Samantha, go home. And I'm like, you're sending me home to, to die. That's how I, I felt. I text my husband like, well, at least I'll be home with you guys if something happens to me. Because no one could tell me what was wrong. I think there's also anger politically about people and politicians saying it's just like the flu or, well, 
there's a high survival rate was like, fuck you, you have no idea. You know, I was a healthy young guy, how this turned my life over. I was lower than I have ever been as an adult. I was feeling suicidal. I wanted to die. Post-COVID syndrome was not on the radar screen of healthcare providers early on. Plus the healthcare system was diverted to really trying to stay afloat and saving as many lives as they can. So these patients were alone. And then they tapped the healthcare system on the shoulder and said, you need to pay attention to us too. I never imagined that my 15 minutes of quote unquote fame would be because I named a Facebook group after a squirrel trucker hat <laughs> that I wore to get a COVID test. The fact that this name has stuck, it's because of our community. People going out into the world and saying, I'm a long hauler. The support groups, we started very early on. Myself, Erica Mastrobono, who's a social worker, Lori Nadell, who's a PhD psychologist. We've all been involved in trauma before. We're New Yorkers, we, we knew what it was like to be here for 9-11. We know the value in community. It's like cheers, it's like you wanna go where everybody knows your name, you wanna go where you know that people know what you're going through. Good evening, my friends. Welcome to another edition of Sunday Night. It starts with yes. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us about some of the times that you've lived with the fear of uncertainty, just not knowing what's what's in your future or what lies ahead? There's no there's no plan for my future anymore. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to support my child. I don't know how I'm going to send my child to college. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. The future scares me. COVID broke me. Nothing in my life, all of the challenges that I have faced broke me like COVID broke me. There are a lot of reservations I have in my hope. There's still dread of what's to come. You know, my life and what it's become is like a travesty. I'm afraid for what it's doing to my kid. Am I hopeful? Yes, but can I pretend like <sighs> this has been anything but hell? No. Can't move. Just stuck in one position all day, all night, all day, all night for days that turn into weeks, weeks that turn into months, and months that sure as hell turned into a year. First picnic of the year. Hmm. Yes. My family is very important to me. They've been very supportive throughout this whole ordeal. I was a very active, hands-on mom, wife, friend, realtor, and I went to like a crippled mess. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, you know, is, is Tony Ann really gonna get better? You know, you heard that long COVID lasts a long time and there's tons of uncertainty as to how long it'll take to come out of it. It was like having food poisoning, a migraine, and the flu all at once for weeks on end, months on end. I'd have good days and then get pummeled and be back in the place where the bed's spinning and I can't move and I'm sweating. This was a list of my symptoms. Paralyzing fatigue, headaches, Vertigo spins floating, sound and light just knocked me out, facial twitchers, tremors, hair loss. And then this was a list of treatments and recommendations. I went from being a person that never took medication to having so many medications I can barely keep up. Like my nightstand used to have my reading glasses and a pen or two over here, and now it's just overflowing. I just, I just want to be done with this already. I want to 
I mean, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But God, it's such a long, dark tunnel. You know, how much of this can a person take? This is some live in hell. Listening to the ambulances night after night, knowing that they were coming for people who probably were not going to make it. I mean, it's something I still haven't really processed. Some of the things that we reported on. Joining us now, member of the New York Times editorial board, Mara Gay. She is one of the millions of people who was diagnosed with COVID-19 and is still recovering. What I'm mainly concerned about at the moment, seeing what I can do as a writer on the editorial board to help New York get through this time. And I'm very worried about my neighbors who don't have the kind of support that I did. The weekend before I got sick, I walked 15 miles in one day from my place to Williamsburg and back. You know, I had been also working out a lot to kind of ease the stress of this terrifying thing that was just hurtling at us. Then one day I was talking to my colleagues on a conference call and I felt feverish and I knew immediately what it was. I put myself to bed and I said, I said, I remember thinking, okay, this isn't so bad. I woke up the next day, I opened my eyes and I thought, okay, the fever is gone. And then I sat up and I realized I couldn't breathe. If you can't breathe, nothing else matters. It creates a sensation of panic from your mind to the rest of your body and trauma from which I am still recovering. The shortness of breath never went away. For months, I would get up in the morning and never really fully get a normal breath. And you start to think to yourself, at every stage of your recovery, is this it? What if I don't get any better than this right now? That has been the hardest and scariest time of my life, is when you feel like you're trapped in the body of an 80-year-old, but you're 33 years old. Am I going to spend the rest of my life struggling to breathe? My family relationships have been really strained. I have a lot of grief um, regarding my relationships in my life that I had prior to COVID and how high functioning and vibrant I was. I'm looking forward to a summer of just those childhood pleasures with my kids where they're not saying, mommy can't come out. Mommy has to rest. When there is a patient with chronic disease, that spills over to the entire dynamic of the family. And what psychological impact is there when you can't be the parent you want to be, or you cannot be the spouse you want to be? Even though my son is three, he asks me all the time, Mommy, are you better? Are you feeling okay? Um, and it breaks my heart. I just don't want to be absent. I want to be present and there. And so that memory that Mommy's here. I knew I always wanted to work with animals. You know, I thought I'd give it a try for a year or two, see where it takes me, and that was 28 years ago, and I'm still doing it, and I still love it. We're going to see one of our snow leopards. She's about to come out on exhibit. Her name is Asha. Animal one to keep her, Tyler. We're in the pavilion whenever you're ready. I first suspected I might be sick with COVID-19 on March 15th. Being sick with COVID right at the beginning when it was at its worst, when hundreds of people are dying, it was a very scary time. I thought I'd be better in 14 days, like they said, two to three weeks, and I didn't. That's when I really started reaching out to find out why aren't I better? Why can't I still 
climb a flight of stairs without becoming breathless. You know, you name it, I saw every specialist for all these different symptoms that just wouldn't go away. Not being able to breathe is probably the most horrifying, suffocating feeling. You know, it took me to some dark places. I had some nights where, you know, I was updating my will. There really still wasn't a whole lot of help for us. When I found Noah's group, I not only saw the webinars and the support groups, but I also realized that he had this boot camp. I was like, oh, well, let me check that out. It made me become disciplined about doing certain things every day, like the breathing exercises, the yoga, the stretching, the meditation. And then, you know, I immediately thought, well, let me reach out to him and see if, you know, I should come see him. So, you know, when I get up in the morning, always come out here, start the day, water the trees, feed the fish, try to start the day in a peaceful, quiet, oh, oh! Like I said, peace and quiet. Every day I get to come out and interact with nature and these trees and these animals. And, you know, if you listen hard enough, they will tell you what they want. And it's kind of a similar philosophy I have in most things that I do, and especially in patient care. It's, it takes looking at things from all different sides. It takes turning things around. It takes feeling, asking. And COVID long haul, is, it's something that just takes all of that. Well, after 27 years, you know that song from like Fiddler on the Roof? I've been with Noah for 27 years. We've worked together. We've been through good times, bad times. That sounds like another song. Um, but Noah is always inspiring, always challenging. You know, just like he wants to lift the patients up, he always wants to lift his colleagues and staff up. And like, and when you see him work so hard, it makes you want to work hard as well. For the last 30 years, I've been taking care of people whose average age was 80 with heart disease and lung disease and COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension. And when we closed our center on March 10th, it wasn't really a choice. You know, we couldn't with a clear conscience say, you need to leave the safety of your home and put yourself at risk to come for therapy. So first order of business was keep people safe. I didn't think like on March 10th when we shut the doors that that would be the last time a patient walked in those doors. Closing down the pulmonary center was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. You know, I thought that was the right move at the time, but after a while, a lot of these patients kind of lost their place to go to for therapy. So when the center closed, I mean, it's definitely a big loss for all of us. When we started to treat COVID patients virtually, we both started to discuss symptoms and things we were seeing. And it was like, wow, these are our, our patients. We heard things like respiratory illness, our ears perked up. We heard things like cardiovascular, um, our ears perked up. We were finally able to get a place where we could have patients and try our theories out. We found that doing what we did with our other patients, giving some patients oxygen, was really helping them get through some of the workouts without feeling the symptoms afterwards. So we thought, hmm, this could be something. There are a lot of ins and outs, a lot of intricacies to this breathing thing. Tell me about it. Some Who people believe it's all hot air. We personally think it's cool. I'm, I'm personally in support of breathing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Noah's partner, Marion Mackles, reached out to me after I wrote my first piece about COVID. And she said, you know, listen, my partner and I are here in New York and anything we can do for you, we will do. When you're ready to come see us, come see us. And I never looked back. Um, I mean, they're giving me my life back. I 
just got off the treadmill after a 45 minute workout, um, which I do twice a week. It feels like I'm climbing a mountain sometimes, but they are helping me to breathe better and kind of regain my health and my life. cranky baby and just need to cry. Sometimes I just need to cry. I just miss my health so much. I miss it so much. Just feeling good and safe in my body. Just honored to be here every week with people who are so open and vulnerable and supportive with each other. And I think we all have been learning lessons from each other about what it means to ask for help. I have been here since the beginning and I have witnessed such courage and depth and grace and faith that I have been so moved by everyone here. It was complete dread before the support groups. Nobody knew anything, and they didn't even know what long COVID was, so I was left pretty much all alone. I've put a lot of trust in Noah, and he's helped me believe. As uncertain as this has all been, he's always said there's no reason to believe you won't get better for all of us. As long haulers, we are strong. We are very strong, but we're also hurting. We're hurting deeply and we can't do it alone. We have to have people like Noah's done and say a few brave pioneers who've really given their all to figure out how to help us. Without access to those people, which most of us just don't have, we're just kind of left out here on our own to, to just try to make it through the day. The remaining symptoms I still have is shortness of breath. I still have chest discomfort and I still have a good amount of muscle weakness and exercise intolerance, but it's gotten so much better over the last few months, especially after I've been doing sessions with Noah. So I'm very pleased with how you're doing. Yeah, I felt great after the last two sessions. You know, I knew I needed help. I wasn't gonna be able to do this on my own. What are the chances that you think that I could start hiking in the spring? I think 99%. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying Everest this <laughs> spring, but yeah, I'm confident. Excellent, I like that. Well, thank you. Coming here in the morning is my favorite time because this is when they're the most interested in their environment and she's just really curious and using the whole exhibit. I think the biggest lesson that I learned from animals is how resilient they are and that resilience is a gift that we all have. Coming back to work was scary because I knew I wasn't the person I was before I left. But coming back did fulfill me in ways that I was hoping it would. I was able to smile again for the first time. I was able to feel like I could do a job again. Sometimes when the female isn't around, he'll display it to his reflection. <laughs> as long as he could see himself through a reflection, he'll display. So when you surround yourself with beautiful things and beautiful animals, you have no choice but to be hopeful. That's pretty spectacular. <laughs> yep, life is beautiful. You know, I saw you kind of in the belly of the beast. Mm. And I saw you get a little better, and then I saw you back in the belly. And you're lucky that you all have each other. Some people don't have that support. What I want to hear from you guys is, you're a young son. Like, how did you stay so strong? And were there times where, like, it was tough to stay so strong? How did you stay strong? I knew that she would get better, so I, I'm thinking, if I help her through the tunnel, 
she'll get better and it'll be normal again. So you knew she was going to get better? I knew she was You never better. doubted it? I didn't doubt it, no. That's awesome. I mean, this has got to make you guys so proud. I mean, yeah. it's really moving to, to see. And, um... <laughs> uh, I give you a lot of credit. This is, uh, this is a beautiful... Can we hear from some of the health professionals on the call? It must have been stressful. How did you navigate this situation? Um, you know, self-care for clinicians um, is, is a huge issue. It's kind of like uh, we're trying to empty the ocean of suffering with a teaspoon. And what helps me is remembering that every day, sorry, I don't know why I'm breaking up. We're all out there with our teaspoons every day. You're out there. Erica is out there. Tens of thousands of us. And we're largely invisible. We're largely anonymous, and that's how we need to be. You know, we're, we're not there to get, to get attention for ourselves. We're there to be of service. And I think that the humility of knowing that so many people who are really giving their all day after day after day uh, I find that that's very uplifting for me. Uh, I take care of people who are terminally ill. I never saw anything like this in my life. There would be nights uh, that I would cry. I would go to bed at night and I would say, I've never seen this. Um, it was emotionally challenging. I then looked for other pandemics, the Spanish flu, where millions were killed, and we found our way out of it. So. Even though I never experienced it before, and experiencing it, I didn't have an anchor to understand it. Going to history helped me. In my anchor, my wife and my children. I would say I'm a better doctor after this. It proved to me that there's nothing that will stop me from taking care of people who depend on me. Nothing. You can't say you don't know now. You could say you don't believe, but if you look at the places where people aren't vaccinated and they're not wearing masks, we're seeing a massive rise in cases. We're seeing a rise in cases, seeing a rise in hospitalizations, we're seeing a rise in deaths. Wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, social distancing, taking care of ourselves, doesn't say I'm not living my life. It doesn't say I'm living in fear. What it says, is that I recognize that there's a possibility for exposure. And if I do get exposed, I want to minimize the severity of it for myself. I want to minimize the number of people I hurt because the people that I know that have lost loved ones, the people that I know that were, you know, deathly ill and are still ill, they get it. You know, my daughter got sick with COVID. And I just, my, my heart sinks thinking about how, you know, she'll carry this with her through life. I don't know to be, 17 and have that it's just it's really upsetting and i just wish more people could wrap their heads around the uncertainty and the endlessness you know i get, I get done with some of these meetings and i can be completely emotionally devastated drained exhausted you know i try to take in as much of it as i can hopefully not allow it to eat away at me. You put on a face in front of people because after 15, 16 months, they don't want to hear that you still don't feel well, you're still suffering. So you put on a face and you pretend for people, but it's exhausting to do. And at the end of the day, it's not living, it's existing and getting through each day. Grateful to be alive each morning, but this yeah. isn't living. I do it because I have dealt with my own pain in my life. I have dealt with my own losses of great people, people that I loved, people that were heroes, and they can't do it anymore. So for me, I will carry that flag for as long as I can. So many people feel alone in the world, even when everything is perfect. And I think just the ability to say to somebody, I am here with you, whether or not I can do anything I'm still here with you. Don't give up. 
No matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark it gets or stormy it gets, don't give up. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep taking one breath after another. Thank you all. Thank you, Noah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It will never stop for me. I have no reason to stop. I mean, if I see somebody in need, um, I'm going to help them. Dear me, you are going to go through something that is going to blow you away. Strip your identity clean off your bones. Your sense of self a ghost that haunts you in this beastly existence. Please. <laughs> it feels so <laughs> Yes, you will crumble. You will internally be reduced to dust. In a restricted body that you lack control. People are going to get vaccinated. The world's going to go back. What is going to happen to us? Everyone's going to move forward. COVID's being in the back mirror. And what about us? We're living, but not living. I think we are the modern day zombies. You will struggle in every way. But you are not gone. You are not lost. And you are not pointless. You will be reborn. Change into a person you never dreamed. Well, I think that you can look at the crowd here who has been through so much and is hopeful and here to celebrate the lives that have been taken. And I think that's where I anchor my hope and resiliency and what this community is calling for. Like your word explains to you, the importance to accept life's complexity <laughs> and to validate our emotionality through it. I want people to know that this virus is not a fake and only the people that are going through this know how it feels. It's sad that they pass and we couldn't be there for them. We need to have more compassion because the thing that hurts the most is not being able to be with them at the, the last minutes. I myself got COVID and it traveled to my family. COVID-19, our survivors, our long haulers, the reason why we're here representing those that are not here, but even beyond that, calling for change. We are walking today because unfortunately my husband, their dad, his brother-in-law passed away. I don't want anyone else to have to go through what the 615,000 families have gone through. COVID has literally taken, you know, so much from everybody. Today is a celebration of you and your life. All the lung haulers who are infected with this virus and are still fighting, we need to stand up with you and fight the fight for medical assistance and to overcome this virus. In pain, there is beautiful growth. Always pour water on your soul. I love you. And always with you. Me.